Yes, 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 yes. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome back to the Moskowitz podcast. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce my guest. Uh, it's the, well, you know, one of the biggest names in our community, Mr. Graham Randall, one of the OGs of UAP. So welcome, Graham. Uh, Hello, Mark. Hello, sir. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I have something in my teeth. I see that. <laughs> it's a bad start uh it can only get better from here yeah 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 well see if people uh, notice it but uh, i hope they don't uh, let's mm -hmm. get a better frame yeah that's much better okay all right um so graham um well sir you have been writing books on uap uh you've been traveling um you're one of the go-to guys in the debrief media. Uh, you're one of the main guests always uh, in the Unident Celebrity Review. Uh, maybe introduce yourself, because I don't think you need any introduction, but maybe tell us about a little bit about yourself, because I also have a Dutch audience, and uh, sometimes, you know, uh, some of my guests are new to them. So okay. go ahead, sir. Oh, thank you. So I'm not sure whether OG means old guy, but I definitely sort of uh, <laughs> I fit that uh, I, fit, I fit that qualification nowadays. And I'm turning 55 shortly. Um, I've I've been interested yeah. in aircraft since I was about four years old. So I've had a long-standing interest in aviation. Um, I sort of got interested in UFOs at about the age of sort of eight or nine um, when I was given a book to read, which was on the subject, and that just fired up my imagination, you know, like nothing I'd, I'd really ever seen before because I was interested in science fiction at that time. And, of course, this was science fiction, but trying to be fact, in other words, that these were things that were supposed to be happening. So that it really did sort of stir my imagination and got me really thinking about, you know, what was going on. And there was definitely something to it. So I was really interested from this early age. Um, in, in my 20s, I, uh, I traveled around the world looking at air, uh, aircraft because I could, I could travel a lot more, had more money because I started work. Uh, I traveled to Siberia. Um, so I spent uh, a few weeks out in, east, in northeastern Siberia looking at Russian airplanes uh, and photographing them. And that was the subject in my first book, um, To the Ends of the Earth. Uh, so that's, that's a non-UAP sort of activity, but that, that's what I'm interested in as well. Um, but I felt that um, sort of last year, because of my interests in aviation, in UFOs, and also um, German sort of secret wartime projects, which I, I've been interested in for a long, long time, 40 years now, that all those things came together in the Foo Fighters, um, which was the, the, the strange phenomenon of um, you know, strange lights, strange objects that were seen by wartime bomber crews and night fighter crews during the Second World War. So I thought, um, there are some books out there which deal with it in part, and there are one or two books which deal with the whole subject, but not in the kind of method that I would have liked to see them covered. So I felt that was something I could possibly write, uh, and that's what I've been doing for the last sort of six, seven, eight, nine months sort of thing. Um, and it's on the verge of completion now. Um, there's just a couple of things need to be done with it, and then it'll it'll be published. So yeah, that's where I'm up to. Um, earlier this year, the, the the Foo Fighters article I wrote for the debrief, as he mentioned before the debrief, um, yes, that got picked up. That got picked up by Chris the Melon. He 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 endorsed it on Twitter, <laughs> saying that it was Whoa. it was really good, um, which I was staggered by basically. So that that got my name noticed. That's how I'm I'm where I, that's why I'm sitting in this chair talking you today it's because chris mellon basically um you know saw what i'd written on the subject and said this is good people should read it and i was you know i was totally blown away by that so i got invited onto um onto louis uh louis uh, jimenez's uh, um unidentified celebrity review and That's then right. of course i was on i was on the big phone home with you um True. as you remember yes I do. With, uh, yeah. with with lou elizondo yeah, uh, yeah which yeah. was you know from i i count myself really lucky and I say, all through my life, I seem to have fallen into things just sometimes by accident. I'm, I'm sure I, I work hard at it to, to, to make things happen, but I fall into things by accident. I went to Siberia almost by accident. I, I, I did this, like fall into this by accident by by writing a few things uh, about on the UAP issue, which Why got are you noticed by a like few a people. Are you like a UAP Forrest Gump or something, Graham? Well, yeah, <laughs> you could call me that. Yeah, people are going to start calling me that. Ger Gerald Greenwood is going to start calling me that now. He's in the chat, I see. Um, so, 
so th these happy accidents that have led to me, you know, where I'm sitting today and, and, the, and the fortunate position I'm in now that I'm, I'm able to write about it. People enjoy, seem to enjoy what I'm, I'm writing. Um, seem people want to, like yourself, want to interview me, uh, to interview me about what I think. So I, I feel like, you know, I have to pinch myself occasionally and think, am I really doing this? I did that on the morning when I was with you talking to Luis Elizondo, you know, yeah. that, that, on that Saturday morning about nine, 10 o'clock in the morning going, Am I really just sitting here talking to Lou Elizondo, the people who, <laughs> person who's known throughout the UFO community? You know, he, he's he, he's lionized by everybody, and here, here's here's me, who's a relative nobody, just sitting talking to him. You know, I was thinking, wow. <laughs> no, 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 not a nobody, not a nobody. Um, <laughs> there, there's a good reason for you to be there, um, and that's why I called you the one of the OGs of UAP, which means original gangster, great. <laughs> <laughs> I like the old guy better. <laughs> <laughs> um no 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 so um yeah it, it's always fascinating to listen to you on uh, uh lewis for example um uh, mm. because you know you're such a force of nature when it comes to uap information and knowledge right and you just told us uh, the interest already started when you were about eight nine years old That's um, right. yes do you remember what was the moment when it caught your attention so as I said, I was interested in science fiction and I was reading Asimov model uh, novels back then, Isaac Asimov, and the books had lurid kind of spaceship covers on them, you know, pictures of spacecraft and some very really nice illustrations. And of course, that fired my imagination anyway, because talking about traveling to the moon and to Mars and, and beyond the solar system was, was, for a small boy, was really, really, you know, sort of invigorating. You know, it, it got your imagination going. It made you think about a lot more than just spacecraft and space travel and aliens and all the rest of it. There was a whole load of the concepts and of course watching things like original star trek there was a lot of moral situations that improved so it was a whole a whole gamut of things that was involved but my mother actually thought she was doing me a favor and she bought me a book which she thought was another one of these novels but it turned out to be a book by uh, a british author called brinsley the poet trench and it was called and it was um a book on ufos and it had a picture of a spacecraft on the front and it looked like the asimov novels but she, of course she was say she thought she was doing me a favor you're, you're mom ruined um, you <laughs> yeah she did yeah she set she set me down this path so uh, <laughs> so i've got her to blame i mean she, she's 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 long dead i'm afraid so she can't she can't uh she can't you know answer back but um so i i, read, I started reading this book thinking it was fiction uh, and it was talking about uh, it was going back to citing sightings from the from biblical times uh, right through the present day. Well, it, it was written in 1973, so um, you know, and I think I got it when I was yeah about eight or nine. I can't remember exactly when. Um, so it was about 1970, 1975, I think, when I wrote it, uh, when I read it. Um, but obviously, I quickly realized it wasn't fiction. It was purporting to be fact. Uh, so there was, you know, stories about, um, you know, all the sort of up to then the famous cases that, you know, for, from the UFO story. Um, and it, 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 was a, it was a revelation to me from somebody who was just reading about fictional spacecraft, fictional aliens, fictional people, you know, um, seeing spacecraft, all, all the rest of it. This was a book that was you know saying look these things have really happened and that did blow my mind um you know i, I was a, i was quite a, a reader at that stage i was reading all sorts of things reading a lot about aviation reading a lot about the second world war and i was quite i, I was you know way beyond pitch, uh, books with pictures in i was reading proper you know proper adult novels and all the rest of it so i was and, and these concepts just went, kept going through my mind and it, it was yeah i was just blow i was blown away by it all uh, and of course reading one book I wanted to read another one. So I went down to the library and just basically got all the UFO books out because right. back in those days, my public library actually had, you know, a whole shelf full of UFO publications, wow. um, you know, but, from people like Adamski, who obviously is, you know has been discredited, but right through to more credulous, uh, cred right like Heid Heineck, he had a book, there was a book of his on the shelf as well. So I went through the whole gamut from um, from the people who people just went, yeah, right, you're just you're trying to you know write a book and it's rubbish, through to people who were really really well respected in the UFO community. So I, I got a I got a quick grounding in in everything that was going on, uh, but that was I say that was a long long time ago. Um, and as years went on, you get you get into your late teens early 20s and like a lot of things your sort of teenager young in you know the interests die away because you start you know you, you you discover girls you discover you know sort of going drinking you know all this kind of stuff all the things that young men do um so 
it, it dipped a bit then, but the aviation side of things took over because I started traveling around the world, taking pictures of airplanes uh, right. and, and writing about it because I was writing for a magazine back then as well. So a lot of other things took over, but I still had this um, interest in the background. Right. And one of the people who I was uh, quite friendly with in the aviation side of things, he was an air traffic control assistant at Newcastle Airport uh, in England. He was also interested in the Area 51 side of things, the, 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 the revelations that were coming out at the end of the 1980s and the early 1990s. And we both used to read um, Glenn Campbell's Desert Rat newsletter, which back in those days, it was all available on dial-up internet. You know, this was, this was back in the Stone Age for computers. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you had it. You had to set. You had to get your modem. You had to dial into it with your telephone. You can hear the dialing tone go. <laughs> start down, yeah, it would start downloading <laughs> things, and then you had to shut it off because otherwise you're going to pay too much money for your phone calls each month. Right. It was absolutely crazy. Anyway, but I used to get this this newsletter about once a month from from this from Nevada, and it and it was just a typewritten thing, but it, it was it was really interesting about all the stuff that was going on then. So that little bit of information each month just kept kept this interest alive because um, th there weren't that many UFO magazines. Again, it was, you know, the internet was fairly early, so you didn't have access to all the information we've got today. There was no Twitter, there was no real social media. The only things that you had were what they called U uh, Usenet groups, which were like, um, were which were bulletin boards, basically. It was very, very early form of social media. I was on a few of the UFO ones on those, but it wasn't quite the same as nowadays. You had to wait ages to get replies. Um, and of course, it used to cost a lot of money using a dial-up connection anyway, so I couldn't I couldn't do it all the time. But yeah, so the, the, the kind of interest just burbled along a bit, you know, just bounced along the bottom a bit. There, it wasn't really anything that was going anywhere for me. Yeah. Um, but all that, changed, all that changed, like a lot of people, changed in 2017. With the look, that was yeah. my next question. There you go. <laughs> yeah, thank I you. Preempted you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. That was actually my next question uh, because mm. you know uh, you you were just elaborating on uh, you know how your interest uh, unfolded for you as a kid, and uh, but then you know uh, you at that time this was all still conspiracy stuff. You know uh, yeah. al the aluminum foil hat uh, stuff. Uh, so, yeah, but what went through you when the Pentagon uh, released, uh, well, not the Pentagon, actually, uh, uh, Lou and Chris Mellon, uh, when they released uh, the footage through the New York Times? What, what went through your mind? Well, it was, it, you, were, you were in shock. You would try to look at it and go, is this really happening? It's in the New York Times. If yeah. they just come out themselves and, and announced it through TTSA, um, you know, then that would have been one thing. And that would have been you know, the, the way that things would have been released back in the day. Um, but because it came out through the New York Times, that gave it a, an air of respectability that nothing that would seen beforehand, you know, through all the years that I'd been interested in it, had ever managed to, to, to get a hold of. So the New York Times, not just only like having a couple of reporters or three reporters looking at the story, but actually being able to get it published and get it past an editor. And then the form it actually appeared in, with the pictures, you know, part of the stills from the um, from the videos, and then of course the you could get onto the TTS web, website and download the videos themselves and watch them. It, it yeah. was all nothing short of amazing, you know. It, it was it was my I'm, I keep saying this. It was mind blowing. <laughs> it was just you, know, you just had to keep looking, going, "Am I really watching what I'm seeing here?" Yeah. And of course, the videos themselves were like nothing else either because we hadn't been tread to that kind of technology. We hadn't no. seen the FLIR technology. So we hadn't seen these, these little kind of like strange objects, these craft or whatever they are, moving around in the way that they were doing. And especially the gimbal one, the one that just you know, ro rotates, you know, at the, end of, at the end of the footage. And it was, I, was, I remembered sitting watching and just going, what? Yeah. <laughs> like everybody else around the world, of course. But, you know, yeah, it was, yeah. It was, it, was, it was crackers. I mean, what did you think about when you saw it? Did you well, have the same thoughts? Look, um, I I have never been such a UAP UFO uh, craze as you were as a kid. Hmm. Uh, of course, I loved uh, the, uh, the 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 science fiction movies from my day, ET, uh, yeah. Star Wars, Independence Day, Star Trek, etc. Um, but uh, I, by that time, I was already a journalist and a, and a document documentary uh, maker, um, and I've always had a a big curiosity for anything you know that that's strange or or 
uh, and anything that's off grid. So yeah. when that footage uh, came out, I my my mind was just blown, and I was just like observing observing anything and everything on the topic I could get in my hands. <clears throat> I started nagging my uh, editor in chief for the magazine uh, I'm working for. I need to write about this right now. And he was like, no, no, we're not going to cover this at all. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, how can we not cover this? This is going to change the world. This is going to change mankind. What is wrong with you? And, uh, you know, I, I, I kept on asking around for the other um, media platforms I work for. And they were all like, no, no, no. What do you want? What do you, what, do you want to commit career, career suicide? Mm -hmm. Fuck you, Max. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so I, and I, I'm still amazed by the, uh, the, the, the lack of interest when that came out worldwide, actually. And um, it was actually when the editor in chief got fired and a, a new one came when I got to cover it. Uh, and th that was last May. <laughs> oh, right. It's a long time afterwards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, though, you covered it, though, didn't you? So you, you did actually get there. You, know, you persevered. Um, and I think the, the New York Times article, because it was credible, wasn't it? It wasn't just some random website somewhere. It wasn't yeah. some UFO newsletter buried away somewhere on the internet. It was no, the New exactly. York Times. Yeah, exactly. You know, so that that was that was what what made it so what you just said that that gave it so much more credit right mm. uh, because it was from the dod it was published in the new york times one of the most respected magazines in the, yeah. In the world yeah, yeah. So, so that allowed yeah. so that allowed journalists not you know just yourself but what other ones around the world to actually cover it and say well if they're covering it it must be all right and it did actually open the door for a lot of media platforms to maybe not take it that seriously but to certainly cover it much more than it was doing it was being done beforehand and of course that opened the door for everybody else as well so people on social media to start talking about it because it was it was fashionable and you could call it that you know people did actually start talking about it and yeah. then of course the people who had been interested in ufos for a long time the, the old you know, the older people who had been through the doldrums if you like because that's what i call them from sort of through the 1990s and the 2000s that's probably not fair on some people who had some really interesting stories and some really interesting cases back there but to me it was it was a bit yeah. of a low period um but you know everybody sort of felt it was okay to come out of the closet and yeah. start talking about it again so you could stop talking to your colleagues at work or to your family about it um because it was it was more mainstream it was in the new york times it was getting shown on cnn it was on the bbc <laughs> you know it was in a lot of places um, i'm not sure what it was like in holland um I'm, well, I'm was sure it, tell us about it, that. You know, but, sure yeah it was interesting because uh in holland of course we we have our little community but they were usually a little bit of the the yeah, nutcases, right? But there was something very there was something very interesting about when um, the New York Times came out and it was covered in the Netherlands through our news channels. The nutcases didn't seem to like that at all, a mm. and I have a theory on why that is because you know they they like the mystery around it. They like to be the 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 the, the, the person who gets channeled by the UAP or uh, yeah. you know they, they would love they love the fantasy and they love you know um, you know to be for some reason um, in touch with them uh, that kind of uh, 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 people but when there was like some real proof they didn't like it at all and yeah. uh, you know they don't like facts nuts and bolts footage so this is when um, yeah, like slowly, uh, there was more and more interested uh, interest in in this topic, but it 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 was really last May, I think, when uh, the 180 day ultimatum was about to uh, come to the end, uh, when the the bigger Dutch newspapers actually really started to cover it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that was probably the same here as well in, in in the UK because a lot more of the tabloid newspapers the 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 
the, the, the ones that sell a lot of copies, they started picking up on the stories, and, and that's happened ever since then. Uh, the, 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 you know, the, they'll pick up on anything. It's a lot of it's quick clickbait, of course. It's just to get readers to the platform, and there's not a huge amount of journalism involved. But some of the people who are in, in some of the newspapers do actually talk to those of us at, at UAP Media UK. So we are slowly you know, building a relationship with, with quite a few journalists and, and pointing out you know, things where they, they shouldn't maybe you know, go down certain roads or there's things they should cover or include uh, and, and put them in touch with people who might be able to give them some more information. So we're getting away from, hopefully, from this kind of just putting kind of sensational stories out there, which doesn't do anybody any favors really in the end. So um, yeah, so hopefully that you know, we're getting down that road a bit. Yeah, so Graham, uh, a question to you. You, of course, you write for the debrief. Um, yeah. um, but uh, um, another, what I really want to know is, uh, after 2017, mm. uh, were there any English magazines or newspapers who allowed you, for example, to uh, write a, an article or a, or a story? Or uh, was there any particular interest to maybe do an interview with you on the topic? No, um, nothing because I hadn't really sort of come in any kind of you know um, sort of public attention at that time. I hadn't been like featured in any um, English newspaper, which I have been now. I haven't, I didn't, hadn't written anything that, you know, of of any note on the on the internet. So that's only really started in probably your know, beginning of this year, sort of thing. You know, February, March this year. Um, so to be fair to to the to you know to the UK media, they, they hadn't heard of me then, and chances are they haven't really heard of me at the moment either. So. Um, um, so, but I, I confine most of that work to the likes of the debrief and to Shadows of Your Mind magazine and to UAP Media UK. Um, so that that's where most of you know my output goes, and of course I'm busy writing the book as well. So that that's where my energies are devoted to. Um, if you know, if I had anything to say back then, I, I suppose I could have actually uh, approached one of the newspapers or a magazine to get it published. And yeah. but who knows? Whether it would have gone in or not, but nobody actually contacted me back then because really I was I was nobody then, and actually I'm nobody now. But you know what I mean. So there you but go. What, you you are an or you are a journalist, right? Or a, no, a, I'm not. I'm not, not a journalist. No, just no, a, no. Or just a writer. So I'm a writer, yeah. I've never ever called myself a journalist. Um, right. I'm certainly just, yeah. I'm only a writer. So um, I, I'm an author. Of, I'm a published author, and uh, I've written I've written articles on aviation subjects and right. you know uh, UAP subjects. But the UAP subjects have only been starting since the beginning of this year. Aviation, yeah. I've written on for you know a lot twenty odd more more than twenty years now. So maybe thirty yeah. years. So a long time. Yeah, so so basically, an aviation expert, an author. Um... I'm not an expert either, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I've, I've got a, I've got a, I've got knowledge on 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 lots of different facets of aviation. What is your day I job, Graham? I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't class myself as an expert. I used to work for the National Health Service in England, but I retired oh. two weeks ago. Oh, yeah, okay. that's my day I... job. Oh, I thought you I were like a, a full, like like a. Oh no, like... dude. No, no. <laughs> no, I'm not a journalist. No, no, I'm not. No, I've taken up full time writing. I'm now self. I'm now a self employed author, but um, that, that's all I do now. So, great. I I, I thought you were like like uh, the UAP Bukowski or something. Oh, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish I was somebody who could just like you know make a living from writing about it, but that's never going to happen, I'm afraid. So I think there's no there's no money to be made in 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 UFOs. At least I don't think there is. I'm, I'm sure some people do make a good you know a good kind of sum out of things, but yeah, um, you know, I'm, I'm not expecting to. Let's put it that way. And I'm not but, and I'm not out to do that either. So no, 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 no. Yeah, I I, I think it's just George Knapp and Jeremy. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure some people make a comfortable. <laughs> out of it because they've got a, a long-standing gig which you know they're respected and i'm not taking anything away from what they do um you know no. they, they found a niche but they also Jer uh, you know george knapp does report on other events as well he's sure. not just a uap ju you know journalist so he sure. has a day job if you like so you know you can't take that away from him and I, i'm sure jeremy corbell's made other films as well um you know he, he has an income stream coming from you know from various um, things I'm sure he has his, his fingers in various pies so you know 
that that works for both of them and i'm sure for other people as well but for the likes of me I, you know i'm never going to make you know a living out of this this is an interest for me and it's a long standing interest and something that i'm heavily invested in but it's because i'm invested in it and i want to see it through is why i'm still here and this is why i'm still prepared to talk about it and you know i'm happy to come and talk to you or other people about it i'm happy to write something which is taking up a lot of time you know because i enjoy doing it and i want to, you know i want to pass on information to people that i want to inform people and i want to be informed by others uh, and that's the reason why i do it it's not because i want to make money from it because i know no, i'm not no, no. be able to do that you know Look, so no no none of us is making a penny <laughs> 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 let, let, let's be clear about that yeah. um no i i've got my day job too uh, <laughs> yeah. i have yeah. to write about other stuff um so let's let's move on a little bit to um um i saw vinnie uh, ask a question you <laughs> yeah well yeah <laughs> the... yeah they did didn't they <laughs> tell us about the aviation expert story oh uh, dear yeah daily star the, the daily star which is a tabloid in in, in britain they yeah. had a they, they came up with a story basically they, they had a story about um MH370, the, the, the missing airliner, um, and somebody had come up with a, a theory that they could use this RF propagation to try and uh, you know, work out where it was um, or which way it had gone to see whether they could find out where the wreckage was in the Indian Ocean. Anyway, UAP media were approached for a quote uh, about it because it was a quote that possibly it could be used to try and detect UFOs uh, and that was the, that was the the kind of the, the way that the article was heading um, and and I, basically it was like it was almost a throwaway comment that I made it was a case of you know look you know if it works great you know we'll, we'll, you can try anything and that was really where I was coming from it didn't actually get put out that way but that's effectively what I was where I was coming from it was that you know we've got if this technology can find help to find you know possible traces of UFOs then I'm all for it um anyway I got credited as an aviation expert in the Daily Star, and I'm no such thing. You know, it's like UFO experts. If anybody calls themselves a, a, an expert in UFOs, <laughs> then you just want to start backing away slowly, you know, because they don't, they're, <laughs> they're talking bullshit. Out of frame. You know, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because really, no, you know, you're talking about unknowns. You're talking about things that nobody has their head around. So how can you be an expert in something that nobody knows anything about? We're yeah, all yeah. guessing here. You might have more information, you might have more knowledge, but that just yeah. still doesn't mean make, make you an expert. No. And and that's the same for me in terms of aviation. I've got a long-standing interest in it. You know, I mean, if you look through my library and I got books in the loft upstairs and all the rest of it, you know, at one time I had over twenty thousand books on our aircraft. You know, I, dude, I have, I have, I've, I've got, I've, I've sold and got rid of a lot of them over the years, but I have, I did have quite a library. You read um, all of those. I've, Pretty much, yeah. Um, and also, you know, just yeah, interested and just breathing stuff, you know. Um, I used to go to air shows around the country. Uh, I used to go to the Mildenhall air, uh, air show in East Anglia. And, and your compatriots from Holland used to have a chartered aircraft used to come across because they were airplane mad. Um, right. you know, yeah, 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 we have a couple have of those. <laughs> well, there was lots of them used to come across on, on Challenge <laughs> Airliners. So I, I used to, you know, you know, sort of like talk to these guys as well. And they were even worse than I was about going around the world looking at airplanes, you know. So um, so there was a lot of that went on. So I used to eat, and eat breathe, and sleep aircraft back in those days. Um, awesome. And now I, I, I do the same with the UAP nowadays, of course. So, yeah, I've got a, I've got a long-standing interest. And, I, and I, I suppose I have picked up quite a lot of knowledge on various parts of, of aviation along the way. But I wouldn't say I'm an expert because... Because quite frankly, there's so much involved in aviation, history, technology, you know, right across the world that you can't get across it all. You know, and, and nobody can. You know, it. it's just one of those huge things. It's like it's like UAPs and UFOs. You know, nobody can be an expert on them because there's so much involved. You know, well, people might have you know, quite a lot of knowledge on certain things. So whether it's Foo Fighters or the 1950s, um, you know, or Roswell or uh, Socorro or, 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 the new, or the new stuff, then that's fine. But you're still not an expert. You just know more than somebody else does. Right. You can't fathom it out. I get it. I get it. I get it. You don't consider mm. yourself an expert. No, no, no <laughs> one, yeah. No. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'll, and, I'm going to put a sign up in a minute. <laughs> yeah. And Vinny is actually paying me to say sorry to you, Graham. 
<laughs> for oh, making yeah, you tell the story. You could, you could have just given me the money. <laughs> <laughs> I, okay, I'll, I'll transfer it to you. Uh, <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> all right. Um, so um, let's let's talk Foo Fighters for a, for a minute. Yeah. Okay. Because this is something that fascinates me too. Um, you did some research on that, I, I can imagine, because of your work. Yeah. Um, and also, you were very interested in German technology during the war, right? Yeah, Especially am, yeah. aviation technology, yes, I, I that's guess. That's right. Okay. Um, so, you know, that there are these iconic photos of a vehicle that looks like a, a, a saucer or a UAP that has the, 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 the cross on it, the German uh, cross, right? Mm. Um, yeah. So can you can you maybe tell us a little bit about that, if, if you have some knowledge on that? Yeah, so this is the flying discs, in other words, that you're talking about, the Fliegende Untertassels, as they were called in Germany. Right. Um, so basically, there's a, there's a, th a kind of story, it's a legend, if, if, I suppose you could call it, that the Germans supposedly developed various types of flying disc during the war. And there were either um, the, the the vehicles themselves, if they were built, were supposedly either captured by the Russians or the technology was transferred to the Americans. It's all very vague. Um, and, and both sides sort of thought that the these discs were being used by the other after the war and supposedly the, the, the story behind the UFO sightings. That's in a nutshell, effectively the story. But right. when you dig deeper into it, it's a lot more complicated. But it comes down to the fact that it's actually a myth, basically. There's no truth in it ah. whatsoever. Um, there's no, I mean, just to start with, there is absolutely no documentation ever, no shred of evidence. So in terms of paperwork for things just like materials or um, trying to get a hold of test testing facilities to you know put them in wind tunnels or something like that or um like looking for places where they could actually field test them or operational tests uh flying of these the things or even just testimony from people who worked on them whether they built them uh, tested them or flew or operated them there's nothing like that the only things you've got in terms of inverted commas proof are a few magazine and newspaper articles in the early 1950s from some of the people who said and just said they claimed that's all they did that they claimed to be designers of these various craft right and they had some lovely drawings and they also concocted these drawings to show you know what they they cooked up somewhere mm. in some workshop or whatever uh, and they said that they were capable of incredible speeds and some of it even test flown and all the rest of it. And then, of course, you've got these artist impressions nowadays. You know, we've got the black crosses on and all the rest of it. And there's one yeah. that even has a, there's one that even looks like it's got a tank turret underneath it, which is upside down. It's actually the tank turret from a, from a, Mark, Pi, a Mark V Panther tank. Right. That's what that's what exactly what it is. And it's upside down on the bottom of this flying saucer. So it's ridiculous, basically. Um, yeah. But there's a lot of people, you know, at various times, from about the 1950s through the, the, the current day have tried to peddle this, this story, this legend, this myth on the fact that the Nazis have supposedly built these flying discs. And it's all rubbish, basically. Um, and I actually, part of the Foo Fight, I mean, the Foo Fighters and these discs are all kind of intertwined. Yeah. Anytime that you go into a website and you look for Foo Fighters, you'll invariably find these, these discs pop up as well. And you'll find a few names. I'm not going to them all now, but you know, it's all contained in the book I've written. Um, and they're yeah. all linked with a story. And every time that you look for these kind of things, they all, the same names crop up all the time. The same people use it as proof, but right. none of it's proof. It's just one person saying something based on something else that somebody else said. So it's all hearsay. It's all secondhand information. But there's no <clears throat> actual evidence. There's no paperwork. There's no documentation. The photographs that you keep talking about. That you're talking yeah, about, yeah. Sorry, I, I was looking. looking yeah, the, that's them. Yeah. They're yeah. all fakes. They're all models. They're all <clears throat> kind of. Right. You know, some of them are very blurry. Anyway, you, you, who knows when they were taken? Um, there was a lot in the 60s, there was a lot of neo Nazi groups got involved in, in trying to peddle this stuff, trying to push it to try and um, look, say, look how great the Germans were during the war. Look at what kind of technology they had. Well, everybody knew they had wonderful technology. They, yeah. they, they, they managed to get jet fighters into the air very quickly. They had rocket technology, they had missile technology. That's not, that's not disputed. But they had very good. One, 
They had very good Jewish scientists. <laughs> they had very good scientists. Full stop. You know. Yeah, know. So I, I don't. I don't want to go down the kind of Holocaust route and things, but no, no, th no. Th they were ahead of their time in a lot of things, but not this. No. Um, you know. So. So what about? I've, yeah. So I've got a, there's about three chapters in the book which are devoted to the discs and two other things which crop up. Um, which are, I suppose you could describe as aerial flak mines, which were basically supposedly remote pilot vehicles uh, capable of bringing down bombers by just spraying gas at them, which would interf uh, interfere with their uh, engine ignition systems. So that's all wrapped up in this whole thing as well. So I've got three chapters to do with this, and it basically just explodes the whole myth. Um, buy this, but, buy this uh, book. <laughs> Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let, let's let's move to the Foo Fighters because you know that's always been a huge fasc hmm. fascination to me because okay. there's much there's much more to uh, to that of course because of all the uh, eyewitness accounts of yeah. Allied forces but also Russians uh, Germans maybe yes um, so it's okay, yeah. yeah it, uh, uh, I, I'm going to be honest. I, I didn't read your your book. I'm, I want mm. to, but but I know uh, you've it's been not writing. Out yet. Oh, <laughs> thank God, <laughs> it's not it's not out yet. <laughs> That's the book you're writing. All right. Um, yeah. uh, so it's it's nearly it's nearly finished. It, it, I've got somebody um, who's pretty well known in the field, which I'm who I'm not saying who it is yet, is writing a forward for the book. Bob um, Lazar and. Uh, I'm not saying who it is. So <laughs> when when it's ready, that's when it'll get published. So that's what I'm waiting for now, basically. Um, I know it is. So it, it's, it's, it's it's on. <laughs> I'm not saying yes or no. It, it's it's re it'll be ready to go as soon as I, I get that. So I'm I'm just um, you know I'm waiting on that. So well, in terms of the Foo Fighters, you, you yeah. mentioned. <laughs> well, I've just answered that question. <laughs> but hopefully, a couple of weeks, but I can't guarantee. It could be, Dude, it could be a couple of weeks. It could be next month. We have a couple of hardcore Dutchies on uh, on this uh, uh, chat, and they, these guys they will buy your book. Like oh, the, the second yeah. when when it uh, when it drops, so that's great. So if you want to, if you want to talk about the Foo Fighters themselves, yes, I went yeah. accounts. They are important, but more importantly, there's actually official records. So you've got uh, if you look into the squadron records. From, I'm just look, talking about the RAF, the Royal Air Force here. There are accounts which are written into the official records. So the each squadron. Each bomber squadron had its own set of records, and you can look at those through the National Archives, and you can find accounts of um, mysterious rockets that follow aircraft. That's what they called them. They weren't just called Foo Fighters. That was an American term that was coined in November 1944. But the same kind of phenomenon in terms of like either rockets or, or strange lights that followed aircraft or were just seen generally goes back as far as March 1942, and probably even earlier. There are documents from 1940 from June 1940, which suggests that there was peculiar things going on back then, but they don't give any dates. Uh, it's just a general comment. But skip to March 1942, and that's when you start hearing about um, and start reading about these kind of strange things that they did see. So there was a big kind of copper-colored object that would followed a bomber um, over the Zuider Zee over the, um, in, Ho in Holland. Um, that's where it was spotted. Uh, and this is you know, quite a long, so this is quite early in the war. Uh, it right. was only a month after the so-called Battle of Los Angeles, where that object had flown right across Los Angeles and uh, forty-two. And fired 40, that yeah, and that fired that was in February nineteen forty-two, and that fired fourteen hundred shell uh, anti-aircraft shells at it and hadn't brought it down. So you know, nobody knows what that was. So that was a huge thing back uh, across in America. But a month later, this this strange object, this kind of luminous. Well, they said it was just a luminous kind of disc. Uh, it, it was very unclear what it looked like. It followed a bomber who opened fire at it. That the the, te the, the tail gunner actually opened fire at this object, and the bullets just went into the object and just did nothing. They didn't come <laughs> out the other side. They didn't damage it. It didn't fall away in flames. It just sat there and absorbed the bullets. I have a question, so, there, Graham. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I, I talked to this uh, Dutch airline pilot, and uh, he had a UAP encounter, and he described it as a mercury kind of so substance, like silver color. Yeah, but also it it, it would like be it was uh, shimmering uh, and almost, kind of almost liquid. And yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it like that? This was this was copper colored. 
and it was wow. they, they could they couldn't work out any kind of structure to it. It was just like a kind of you know like an oval, kind of like a disc shape. Um, but it was following the bomber, so they opened fire at it, and then it moved round to the wingtip. After a while, so that meant that the tail gunner could open fire it, but also the nose gunner could open fire it as well because this is a Wellington bomber. It had it had gun positions at either end of the bomber, um, and at one point, you know. It must have been far enough away that both both turrets could actually angle enough to actually open fire it at the same time, um, and then it moved around to the no to the front of the aircraft and started flying ahead of it, and then just shot off into the distance. And all the while, it had been fired at because obviously they thought it was some kind of German weapon or a German fighter or something or some you know unknown German secret device. But they didn't bring it down. So this was like a kind of forerunner of all the other things that happened afterwards. So you go through into night into late nineteen forty two, and you've got. Um, bombers over the Alps uh, attacking targets in northern Italy from from Britain, and they were seeing huge two hundred foot long object torpedo shaped objects flying through the through valleys in the Alps. Now you know what the hell were those? So there's another story. You've got yeah. other things that were seen. Um, the daylight raids that the Americans who were flying over Europe in the day, they were seeing odd things as well that they couldn't really work out. So it wasn't just a nighttime phenomenon either. Uh, it, it went right across both both day and night. Then you get later in the war and the, the change from just being lights to they call them rockets in the official reports. And mm. you can find these um, accounts of rockets that didn't just follow the aircraft, but they changed direction. It wasn't just like a ballistic rocket, you know, like a like a V two rocket that just goes up and comes down. They were they were actually being seen to change direction, so that indicated some kind of control, some kind of guidance. But the Germans did, although they were developing rockets like anti aircraft rockets, they were only doing that in nineteen forty three, and oh. they didn't have much success with it either because none of them ever entered service. So uh, you know, you know that through, or I know that through the kind of research I've done into these kind of weapons. So a lot of things didn't add up. There's a lot of things being seen, but what were they? Because they didn't match what the Germans actually were working on, or at least the things that they were working on, they couldn't get you know, they couldn't get them right. They couldn't perfect them. And then as you go through the war into, into late 1944, even before the Germans started fielding jet night fighters, which started happening around Christmas 1944, right. the, Allied, the Allied bomber pilots at night were seeing them. They were seeing them in October. They were seeing them throughout November. I've just been looking to, uh, in the last couple of days at a huge number of reports of jet, what they call them jets. But then when you dig into the intelligence reports, which come separately to the squadron reports, they yeah. say that they were just calling them jets because they didn't know what they were. They were just right. fast-moving lights. That's all they were. So, But because they were expecting the advent of the Germans feeling jets, you know, at night, that's what they started calling them. But they were calling them rockets because they had no other frame of reference. And of yeah, course, they humanized you know, it. Yeah, yeah, they did. Well, they did. They they put them in terms that they couldn't understand. Right. Because no, they they didn't think in terms of UFOs or UAPs or aliens back then. That wasn't anything in their vocabulary. You know, no. that was years ahead in the future. That was 1947. In, in 1942, 1943, 1944, everything was a German secret weapon. If you didn't understand what it was, it was something the Germans had cooked up. You know, it wasn't something from outer space or from a from a fifth dimension or, or from somewhere in the future. You know, it was it was something in the here and now. It was something they could understand. So it was a, it was a light. It was a rocket. Sometimes they called them enemy aircraft, unidentified enemy aircraft. There's a huge um, kind of analysis that they did in 1942, and that's through the intelligence reports. They kept trying to work out how many of these lights followed the aircraft and could they identify what they were. And in most cases. The gunners couldn't even work out what kind of aircraft were behind the lights. They were just lights. And, it, you know, you're talking about wartime. You're talking about German night fighters. And their job was to shoot down RAF bombers. And right. I'm sure a fair few of them crashed over, over Holland and were shot down over Holland. Oh, yeah. Which, you know, yeah, exactly. But if you were a German night fighter, would the last thing you, would, you know, the thing you do was have a light on your aircraft because it would just advertise your presence Try to an to RAF bomber. Yeah. You know, yeah, exactly. W what's the point? And you know they didn't do this kind of thing, so yeah, there's a lot going on here. And I try to unpack all this in the book as well to explain that a lot of these things that were being seen couldn't have existed because you know lights you wouldn't have put lights in an aircraft and I explain why. And then of course the rockets couldn't have been the anti-aircraft missiles because of a whole range of reasons. And then you know and and some people and I've heard this on Twitter as well. People say to me, well they're just a V1 flying bomb. Well. <laughs> Okay, well, that that yeah. sort of 
if you come out with things like that just off the top of your head, you're demonstrating a lack of knowledge because a lot of these bombers were up at 20,000 feet, 24,000 feet, 25,000 feet. And if they're seeing things at that altitude, it can't be a V1 because a V1 didn't fly above about 3,500 feet. Um, no. It was powered by a pulse jet engine, which was inefficient at heights above nine or 10,000 feet. It's the reason why they didn't use them to power aircraft. They just used them to power, to, to power a flying bomb. So, you know, you have to get into this kind of level of knowledge. Yeah, and of course, so you the, can behavior, work out why. The, the behavior of a V1 is just, it, it wasn't modern technology. It's a straight it line. A straight line, exactly. Yeah, flew in a straight line, but it flew very yeah. low because of the limitations yeah. of the engine that powered it. Similarly with a V2, if you saw a V2 launch, even at night you knew what it was because it was a big pl white plume of, of you know, kind of flame and it went straight up. It usually went straight up to about 40 or 50,000 feet and then canned over at an angle about 75 degrees and then shot off like that. Uh, and so that's how we knew. And I do put some um, kind of quotes in the book from people who did see them because they're in the official records as well, just to distinguish the difference between those and what people were seeing, because it's obviously it's quite obvious that these things couldn't have been V ones or V twos, but what right. they were is another question. Um, you know, and it, it, I can't answer that question because I don't know, but I know what they weren't. Or at least I'm pretty sure I, I, I know what they weren't. Now um, I have a question for you. Uh, at the end of the war, uh, hmm. are there any accounts of these uh, Foo Fighters interfering with the nuclear weapons? No, not as far as I'm aware. There's one story, however, about a nuclear plant at Hanford, which is in America, um, because I don't actually delve into the Pacific or the American side of things, uh, you know, in terms of continental USA. I don't delve right. into those in, the, in, in my book. I'm only looking at the European things. I'm planning to probably to write a book about the Pacific side of things at some later stage, but I have just concentrated about Europe. However, there's a story about in 1945 that um, a, a, U, a UFO, a UAP, was seen over the Hanford nuclear uh, or the atomic kind of research plant, and they had to scramble fighters after it. So right. that's the only particular story there is. Um, you know, there may be things which are buried away in official records, which are hidden away or locked away that we're not aware of. Excuse me, but um, I haven't found anything like that. And as far as I'm aware, there's nothing you know along those lines. But that story about Hanford is the only story that I'm aware of. So yes, there was one, but that's as far as it goes. Um, okay. And I think uh, Christian just put a quote up there saying, "Was were Foo Fighters seen in the Pacific War? Yes, they were, to answer Christian's question. There was a lot of sightings then. There were a few earlier in the war, but most of them started in about 1944, went through in 1945, and they continued after the war in Europe had ended. But after the, the war in Japan, uh, against Japan had finished, they, ta they trailed off like they did in Europe. And that was possibly more to do with the fact that there weren't so many people flying around. You know, during the war, you had tens of thousands of people flying every day right across Europe, right across the Pacific. They were bound to see things that happened. Once the war finished, all those flights, you know, stopped. There weren't so many people flying around. So the number of sightings decreased uh, until, well, 1947 when things picked up again. So that's the reason, right. probably the reason why. All right. Um, so... Can I take a little uh, toilet break? Uh, sorry, viewers. Yeah, sure. uh, I, I'm I'm a human being. Do you want me to do uh, a song or something, or I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll act out a little play or something while you're gone? <laughs> well, well, maybe uh, you can uh, elaborate on where people can find your book, and you know, okay. and, and maybe an indication on, uh, you know, about when it will drop. So yeah, sure, I'll, I'll do that while you, until you come back. Yeah, for sure. I'll I'll be right back. Yeah. All right, okay. people. Here's my buddy. Hey guys, I'm going to take this over now. I'm going to talk about something completely different. No, not honestly. The the book, yeah. As I said before, I'm just waiting for one particular piece of the book to be written. Um, and once that's done, then it's a question of just getting it straight out. It'll be available on Amazon. It's a it's a print on demand book. Um, I'm not um, well known enough to get a publishing contract with anybody. I'm afraid. So it, it'll be that way. But that won't deteriorate from the the quality of the book. I've already had one book published through through that process through amazon and it's it's gone it's gone fine uh, the books the books actually look great um i've got a copy of my that's the copy of the book i wrote about siberia um so you can see it's you know it's pretty good quality so um 
the Foo Fighter book's going to come along those lines. I'm hoping that I'm going to get something by the end of this month, and it'll be out by then. Uh, but also, the announcements will be on Twitter and you know everywhere else, so uh, you, you'll get fair warning of when it's coming out. I'll even make a, a, an announcement in advance, probably to say, yeah, it's out, or oh, it's coming out. Um, I'll talk a bit about the Foo Fighters as well, just while uh, Max is away. That 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 story that um, I told about the the bomber that you know shot at the 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 ufo whatever it was that's not a an isolated incident there were plenty of other cases in the war where these things were fired on um and i know there are stories from russia from the and cuba from the 1960s and 1970s where some of their mig jet fighters were shot down or or destroyed because of interactions and opening and fire on some of these ufos that they were experiencing and you might think that the same would have happened back in the war, but apparently not. Um, of course, if anything was sh shot down by a UFO, then chances are you'd never get to hear about it because the, the information would have been lost with the death of the crew. Um, so it can only go on the information that I've been able to get through official records in that respect or through eyewitness testimony. But yeah, the, there are several accounts in the book where I've got where um, there are accounts of gunners or fighter pilots even shooting at these these objects there's two particular stories which are, are, are you know quite fascinating in that respect so yeah and here's max back from the toilet hey guys <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, i actually uh, went to the toilet and i had to check on my son i'm uh okay I'm a, yeah I, I, I'm a single dad, so you know I. I oh I right, do okay. Yeah. You actually missed it. I did a really good song and dance number, so you, you, I'm afraid you missed it. Ah, did you did, do the Gangnam Style again, or? Uh... Uh, yeah, yeah, you missed it. You, you, <laughs> yards, you missed it. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, what I'm particularly curious about, uh, of course, are your um, Russian adventures because. Uh, that is still a very much big mystery to to me, and uh, there's supposed to be supposedly uh, a lot to gain over there. You know, uh, maybe even pre-war, during the war, and of course up until now. Um, so, are you interested in, in in Russia, and and what do you know about their cases up until now? I mean, just generally about Russia, I've been fascinated in the country since the Cold War. I, I, I'm a child of the Cold War. You know, I'm the kind of a generation where we were told that, you know, we, we might get bombed when we get the four minute warning. You know, I used to be frightened of um, of nuclear war when I was a kid. I'd watched Threads, which was a really uh, horrifying BBC um kind of uh, d drama about a, a potential nuclear attack on, sh on the city of Sheffield. And it was frightening when I was what 12 or 13 year old seeing this, mm. you know, I didn't sleep for days, uh, nice. for nights sort of thing, you know, so it was horrifying. So I lived through all that. So I was always right. interested in knowing about what the other side were, like, um, were, were up to. So not even just UFOs, I was interested in Russian aviation from an early age. Yeah, about their air force, about about Aeroflot, and about and about just the history, and of course also about the Eastern Front as well. Um, not just I'm not just interested in aviation and German secret technology during World War II. I'm also interested in in what the war, war history the war was like on the on the Eastern Front. So I'm, yeah. I I know about things like um, the, the the SS. Um, having units which were made up not just of Germans, but also of Norwegians, of, of even Swedes. Dutch. Um, actually, of Dutch, yeah. Landstor Nederland, that was what it was called, yeah. Um, yeah. They, fought, they fought for the SS, uh, the 34th um, SS. We had um, about uh, 25,000 uh, boys going to the Eastern did. Front. I yeah, think, that's right, yes. I think maybe less than five came back. <laughs> uh, there was like one, many came back from, from <laughs> Russia, that's right. So, and there were even Spanish uh, who fought on the German side in Russia during the war. So, you know, things like that are fascinating to me. So, mm. you know, all that kind of stuff I'm, I'm interested in. I even have a, a, a Russian a few Russian cases in the book as well because I've, I've covered those just for completeness. So, and, and that actually, one of those stories includes a, Spa a Spanish unit, funnily enough, who were fighting uh, near Leningrad. Oh. So, so you're, that's you're gonna, a, that's an I don't want story. you. I don't want you to tell your whole book right here. Man. I'm not going to tell. No, I'm just going to give that. I'm just going to say that's all there is. So, but I, you know, I'm dying to know that story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there, there you go. So there are all these interesting stories. Now, you've got to bear in mind that UFOs were a forbidden subject in in Russia during communist times. There was a brief window in the night in the late 1960s where it was acceptable to talk about them, but it was only acceptable for about six months, and then they cracked down on it again. 
So, you know, they have this kind of, um, you know, it was a taboo subject. Um, you couldn't talk about it because so, at, at one point they thought it was psychological warfare on the part of the West trying to undermine, you know, kind of social, the, the social fabric of society. You know, so the, they had a real thing about, oh, you can't talk about it. But in other ways, they were actually quite open about it because they did have commissions. They had a, a policy where they had the whole military looking out for these things and reporting them. And of course, the, you know, the Soviet military apparatus was huge. You know, spread across a huge part of the globe as well. I mean, you know, Russia from from Europe right across to the Bering Strait is a vast part, you know, piece of land. Huge. So, you know, that they had a they had a long, you know, a big um, kind of facility, this huge facility to actually look for UFOs. And of yeah. course, they were all alert for for NATO and for American bombers. So they had this huge air defense apparatus which were looking up in the skies all the time, not just electronically but visually. So, you know, they were always reporting things. So there's this, this, there's this huge kind of, um, you know, like like crop of stories from out there, which in their own right are fascinating uh, when you get into them. So, yeah, I, I'm interested in that as well. So let's uh, stick with uh, World War uh, 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 the, the, the World War topic. Um, hmm. A couple of weeks ago, uh, me and Vinny, Disclosure Team, shout out, sign up, um, subscribe. To uh, disclosure team, um, we, you know he's one of us now, don't you? So, yeah, you, you, yeah, you I know, know you're UAP me. media now. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, I wish I was British. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll have to have Anne, and we'll have to have Anne Netherlands at the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like like the token <laughs> Dutch dude. Yeah, hey, like hey. The, the, the mascot. <laughs> you're, not, you're not a to you're not a token at all, Max. You're doing some great work, mate. So. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks. <laughs> Um, so uh, let's talk about Mussolini, uh, because uh, on the Max and Vinny show, um, we try to interview an Italian guy, <laughs> but, okay. <laughs> but and he was a, a an Italian UAP uh, expert. But you know, it was like uh, trying to interview uh, Roberto Benigni. He was we couldn't really understand what he was saying, and he went uh, very quickly to to religion too. <laughs> but oh, yeah. yeah. But he was a great dude. Uh, we, had, we had some fun. But he told a couple of interesting things we could understand. Um, first of all, uh, Lou Elizondo mentioned that uh, to me uh, the second time I interviewed him that mm. I think um, R it was RS thirty three. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, yeah. The, the Americans got a got an, a gift from uh, from uh, Mussolini, and it was mm. apparently a archaeological find from italy and they were like uh, there you go guys here's a gift but there's yeah. no real documentation on that but yeah. they, but the, the italian dude sent me one uh, uh piece of uh, a piece of paper where it's actually yeah. uh written down on um what do you know about this mussolini uap do you know i know about the same as you do there's very little on it there's pretty much what yeah. you've just encapsulated there there's that information there's that like kind of little scrap of of kind of a document and that's it yeah <laughs> there's very little else to go on the thing the first time i ever read about it was one of, one of timothy good's books back in the 1990s and he mentions this um this italian kind of uh, organization i think it was called rs33 and it was um you know just uh, it was looking into this thing because i think they'd had they'd say they'd had a find i think that maybe even had a crash um that they'd investigated that's what the story is again how much how much how much truth is in it you can't really tell um because a lot of these things sort of like grow in the telling um and of course at the same time or maybe just shortly afterwards the um the, some italian scientists actually get caught up in the flat in the german flying disc myth as well so right. I, i'm not entirely sure how much kind of credence to put in this story it's one of these things i'd love to be true don't get me wrong um right. you know but at the moment there's simply not enough and what i have read on it i'm still not convinced and i, I understand Lu, Lu Elizondo is perhaps he has more information that he can he can tell people i don't know um, well you know i would love to know exactly what he knows about it yeah well he had this Lou Elizondo smirk on his face hmm. uh yeah. let, let me let me see if i can <laughs> <laughs> let me see if can, <laughs> let me see if i can uh, uh pull up this uh a piece of paper yeah, the, document. the document exactly yeah i, I, I 
I, I'll find it. I, I have it in my uh, UAP. Um, hold on, guys. Hold on. I promise I won't take too long. I just need to find it. Um, I got it. Got it. All right. Let me... Well, that's a bit too big. Let me see if I can pull it out a little bit, stretch it out a little bit. Well, I'll see if this fits. Let's give it a try. Let's give it a try. Um, all right. Share screen. Yes. Mm. Hmm. Can you guys? Yep. See that? That's exactly what I've got. That's exactly what I've got as well. <laughs> <It's> got, <laughs> for me, it's it, it, yeah. it got really vague. I don't know if you can still see it. No, I can see it. Yeah, yeah. It keeps it keeps fading out, but yeah, I've seen it. Oh, like yeah, that's, now, a, that's now. exactly what I found as well. Um, yeah. yeah, it's a telegram, isn't it? Basically, basically, that is a telegram. Now, I do, I can read a little bit of Italian. Mm -hmm. um, but I have to minimize it to actually get to read it. Um, no, I can I cannot read it from here. But um, yeah, so basically that was uh, what he, what he sent us. But maybe you can you you have a better uh, uh, piece of footage. <laughs> I've just got. I'd say I've got a copy of that. I'm, I'm just looking at it on my phone at the moment. Um, yeah, and that that's that's all there is basically. And it, yeah, again, you just have to. I mean, they've, they've said it's supposed to be an, a, a, an authentic document, um, but I'd I'd love to know more before I can give you before I can sort of you know get it into my head about what's actually going on. Yeah, it, you, it's intriguing. It's intriguing. Yeah, but, you know? yeah, what what actually intrigued me was that uh, Elizondo mentioned it. Yeah, and, and, exactly. And, that's that's why. And and, and you know, you're, whenever you're, whenever he mentions something, um, mm. and and basically pushes you in a certain direction, yeah. <laughs> that's what he does. Well, if he, if he <laughs> if he if he mentions it, you're going to sit up and take notice, aren't you? So there, there's yeah. clearly some more that we're not privy to here. Um, but like a lot of things, you know, there's information stored away in places that may just won't be revealed, and, it, and for good reason, maybe. So I'm afraid at the moment we've got this. And we've got some little bits of information around it, but they don't add up to much yet. So, you know, we can only wait for future kind of developments, basically, before we know more, before we can say more on it. It's 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 like having a jigsaw puzzle, but only having about five pieces out of a hundred. Yeah. You know, you, you can't you don't even know what the picture is going to be, let alone what it is. So you can't explain it. If you try to explain to somebody what the picture is going to be when you've only got five pieces, you know, you're not going to get very far, are you? So, you know, that's that's why I look at this and, and a lot of other cases. We, we, we simply don't have enough information. But it's intriguing. It's compelling. And that's a word that, you know, Lee, Lee yeah, there's uses a, a lot. Yeah, yeah there's, there's, a, <laughs> there's a couple of things I think uh, were interesting because... First of all, Lou mentioned it and 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 told me mm. told all of us, all of our colleague uh, colleagues uh, right here in the chat uh, yeah. to look into it. But uh, one of the pieces of information was it was an arche archaeological find, uh, yeah. which which brings me to Lazar's story. And Lazar's story uh, was what? Yeah, when he was working at Area Fifty One, as he claims he was. Um, they were working on back engineering an archaeological uh, UAP. Now, I made the connection that it it could be that one, right? If it was it's a gift possible. to America, if it was a gift to America, um, that could be the one. Mm -hmm. But, you know, again, no proof whatsoever. You, would also, so, uh, you also have to work. wonder why they were making a gift to America in the first place. You know, if it was some kind of radical technology, why why wouldn't it? Because actually, it was pre-war. Eh? It was pre-war. Yeah, yeah. But, it, but in 1931, 1933 kind of time, in the early 1930s, the Italians were quite far ahead in terms of aeronautical prowess. They were, they? they were considered to be you know quite one of the leading kind of air arms in Europe. 
you know, more so than the Germans because they hadn't established the Luftwaffe at that time. And they're also in some respects ahead of the RAF uh, and a lot of other like nations in Europe in terms of flying aircraft and building aircraft. So you, you've got to understand, wonder why the Italian aeronautical firms like Fiat and, and like Piaggio and a few other companies didn't just get a hold of this information and keep it for themselves and, and develop it themselves. Why were they giving it to America for? that? That I don't understand that bit. Uh, and that, that's that's a kind of fact that's been niggling away at me. But, you know, it, it, we just need more information, Max. I'm, I'm afraid, you know, it's one of these things that it's great discussing it, but w without the rest, the, some of the pieces of the puzzle, we're not going to be, you know, it's just, well, you know, who knows? <laughs> I think that's, yeah, yeah. who but knows what's going on, you know? Why, why did the French it's get this? Don't get me wrong, it's interesting, though. And, and that, you know, you're talking about the a possible link between um, an archaeological find in Italy and maybe them passing it on to America because they didn't know what to do with it. And maybe yeah. that's where you know, Lazar's story comes from. Who knows? That that could well be right. But well, they were giving well. each other. Well, they were giving each other gifts. You know, the French gave the Statue of Liberty. To, to oh New yeah, York. yeah, that's very but true. They, yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah. They, they were certainly giving each other you know <laughs> quite large gifts if you're talking about the Statue of Liberty. Yeah, but yeah. you. But in terms the of Dutch, like things, the Dutch, and the Dutch gave the Eiffel Tower to France. So. Did they? Uh, that I didn't know. <laughs> no, did <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't no. know that. Yeah. No, we gave we gave one wooden. I, I believe. I, yeah, I would have thought they, they would have kept that for themselves and put that down somewhere. You know, I don't know where would you put that in Amsterdam. You know, you'd want to keep it yourself, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, we have like a mini miniature on uh, Dam Square, but it it looks like a penis. Um, oh god oh, I fell for that um, <laughs> <laughs> what was I saying yeah there's also another story which, which actually is RS-33 there was supposed to be a crash in about you know whenever it was in the early in the 1930s so there are other stories going around about the same time now whether they're all the same thing and whether the details are getting confused from one kind of incident to another we just don't know there's there's too many gaps in in you know what people know uh, but if Lou, if Lou says it's interesting then you know there must be more to it I think because I, I wouldn't have thought he would just latch on to some kind of wild ass kind of you know sort of like fantasy about you know somebody making a story up so uh, there, there must be there must be a lot more to it I think it can't be just a telegram and and an account there must be more to it than that yeah uh, well th this is true too wilfred yes yeah yes. Uh, that new amsterdam yeah that, that much i know uh, yeah we <laughs> actually we traded it for i think it was suriname <laughs> but uh okay right yeah 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 <clears throat> we we lost brazil to the portuguese and then the 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 british still had a part of north brazil which is now suriname and yeah. we we traded it for new amsterdam which became new york so, okay. a little piece of history, guys. <laughs> and, you, and you had Java and Surina, um, Sumatra somewhere, didn't you? The, the Dutch East Indies. And I think lost, you, yeah, you lost them to the Japanese. Yeah, we, yeah. yeah, we lost a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but we also conquered a lot. You did, so, yeah. yeah. By the way, Graham, did you know we hmm. actually um, uh, 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 invaded London and took your uh, crown ship? That I didn't know. Is that true? Is that yeah, nothing that is... else you're making up? <laughs> no, no, sir. That is very true, and well, it is hardly covered in Engli uh, any English history books. I'm going to look into that. A reason. <laughs> well, I'm going to look into that because that's interesting. The, du the Dutch yeah. were the Dutch were a really good seafaring nation, weren't you? Weren't you? So yeah, we we were at war a lot with you guys, hmm. but also with yeah, Spanish. We and uh... <laughs> but we all we all made it. We made up after that, and you know, yeah. obviously, I think we helped you out in the hunger winter, didn't we? So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. No, look, look, you, you guys saved our butts. That's true. Yeah. Well, um, God, I can't, I can't even imagine what it must have been like to live through that. Yeah. Um, well, I, okay. I read story. I've read stories about it before, but it's, it, it must have been horrendous. Well, you know, you guys in England, uh, you were they bombed the shit out of you, you know. Uh, but you know, um, the, the the stories on the bombard bombardments on London, they, they, those are just awful. You know, it was relentless. Yeah, but the, the pale in significance when they talk about things like Hamburg or Dresden, though, uh, you have to read some of those counts and you just think, well, you know, oh. they kind of reaped the whirlwind, didn't they? So, there we go. yeah, you know, the, the, that was actually mass murder, <laughs> you know, more or less. Like, yeah. yeah, if it was done, as, if it was done in peacetime, it would have been. 
yeah 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 that, that was just revenge um which is not good um but you know it was strange strange times uh so uh let's let's move on a little bit to current events um uh, so hmm. what are you looking at right now what, what do you think is most fascinating at this stage because we we just had uh you know the the the, the pentagon report coming out no, the, to mm. a lot of people it was a little bit disappointing i wasn't that disappointed because was you know there. there's a, yeah there's 144 cases they can't explain so that's a lot to me um so there's a lot to investigate but there's this slow uh drip of information uh which i think is actually tactical uh, but that's my my personal opinion because I think they're slowly just massaging this if, uh, into the, the 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 general public, you know, the, the UAP, UAP uh, topic. You know, uh, the last months, yeah, basically the last couple of months, is, it's getting really picked up in Holland, but I think it's a worldwide phenomenon. Yeah. Um, but uh, so after the, this Pentagon report came out, uh, what do you think is most exciting to me? What one of the most exciting things that came out of that is actually the Galileo uh, Galileo project Avi Loeb because now why are you laughing you just stole my answer <laughs> oh shit no. oh, you, well, you, you, <laughs> you steal you my see, questions I'll steal yeah, your yeah yeah well it's, it's revenge <laughs> <laughs> yeah but that that's the bit I'm excited about it's actually this fast that scientists are getting involved not just Avi Loeb but other people as well yeah. and they're, they're, they're coming up the people who were already there, we know about, but there's other people coming out of the woodwork as well. Um, so that it, obviously it's becoming more respectable. It's not a career ending move for, for some people. Um, and even if you've got something like Seth, uh, Seth Shostak, who you know wasn't just agnostic about UFOs, he was he was quite like against UFOs. You have, just have to watch that 60 minutes, the morning piece before the you know the the, the much better uh, evening piece that came out uh, where he was interviewed and he was just saying you know there's nothing to it um and everybody just thought oh he's, he's just after more money for seti because you know that's what he's interested in but then right. if he comes out and joins something like you know if he, the you know this new initiative that's come out now then you just think okay well when's this going to stop you know are other people going to come out and start thinking well actually this is something i can get into is neil degrasse tyson going to suddenly uh, do a kind of vault fast yeah. and go yeah i'm really interested in ufos now i can't think that's going to happen though but no. no being seriously being serious for a minute having scientists incredible scientists looking at it looking at it objectively um you're not saying there's actually we're definitely going to find something, but just applying rigorous scientific methods, things that can be peer reviewed and checked you know, to the nth degree um, and that come up with credible information uh, and things that maybe spur other people to look more deeply into it as well can only be a good thing. You know, it's all right. very well for for people like you and me talking about it, and people you know on um, Luis's program, uh, and people ringing centres and all the rest of it, and getting politicians you know into it and, and making decisions. But you've got to have people who are experts, and they these are experts. You know, you can't really call them anything else. That you know they're proven. They've got a track record um, in, in various scientific fields. They're the people who you know will be able to come up with the goods if anybody can. Yeah, I have a, I have a little spoiler alert for you guys. Um, anytime I'm going to talk to a uh, Belgian scientist who is, um, uh, he has a Belgian Dutch company uh, on, uh, let's, uh, I can't say too much, but it's on AI. And uh, they're also going to pull their weight on, uh, on this topic. Um, because Avi Loeb, uh, of course, he's going to, uh, you know, uh, the, the the his scientists they're, they're going to work on new telescopes um but what this guy is doing um he has a supercomputer that can uh, analyze existing footage 3d so that means um there's going to be uh, it's it's going to be accompanied with the footage the the available data it's going to be 3d so they can analyze whatever is going uh, on uh, from all angles with all data so this is exciting to me we're going to talk to him anytime soon so uh the the scientists are are, are you know they're they're coming um which is great yeah. you know what is especially great about this which is what uh, avi actually elaborated on 
uh, lots of the information Lou, for example, has, or the DOD, is classified. They, they are not allowed to share it. Um, so what Avi Loeb can do is create new uh, means of science that are shareable for yeah. uh, the uh, uh, mainstream public. Uh, the well, that, that's it, isn't it? Because anything that the military have or, you know, that's yeah. locked away, if, let's say for our argument's sake, that they, they said, yes, okay, okay, the scientists can look at this. The scientists would then have to assign a, a non-disclosure agreement. So therefore that information would never come out and that they just couldn't talk about it. So yes, you're right. They're going to have to create their own data, their own information that can be shared, can be peer reviewed, and then can be put out into the public into the public uh, sphere and that's the only way that we're ever going to get any you know sort of real sort of you know movement on this because everything that's done in-house by the military and it's under a cloak of secrecy you know that's never shared is it so nobody ever gets to know about it nobody ever knows what they're doing with it whether they're actually doing anything with it at all or even how far ahead they are with knowing what's going on i mean my <coughs> personal opinion about you know how what they know and what they you know what they suspect is that they're not much further forward than we are you know they have a lot of information but that information doesn't basically you know sort of like translate into a huge amount of knowledge about what's going on they're probably just as much in the dark as everybody else is uh, but that, that's just my personal theory and that that's something that i've i've you know felt for a long long time that they got they maybe have got these initial kind of crashes in terms of craft or whatever back in the 40s and maybe even earlier but quite frankly they didn't even know what to do with them you know it was all it was all wonderful technology it looked like magic more or less but you know <laughs> they had, they had the si yeah well ma you might as well be um you know if you give if you go for Isaac newton uh you know uh, an iphone um you know if, in the 1600s and told him what you know do, hey yeah, go, there you go isaac here have a look at this he wouldn't know what to do with it would he you know especially <laughs> if the battery ran out you would have no clue. You could maybe take it apart, you know, yeah. you know, by brute force, but you'd be no further forward. You wouldn't understand what the the things and you know the bits inside an iPhone were, you know, let alone the you know the, the, how the display works and all the rest of it. No. You'd be stumped. So in the 1940s, let's say they get a hold of a craft, let's say Roswell, just for instance, mm -hmm. you know, the scientists wouldn't know what to do with it. They wouldn't even maybe know how to get inside it. Never, never mind how it flies. So they'd have to have put it away somewhere and go, you know, oh, guys, we'll just wait five years. We'll, we'll come back in a few years' time when technology and our knowledge has increased. We'll see if we can get you, we can work out what's happening. And they'll go back to it in 10 years' time or something and go, yeah, okay, we still don't know what's going on. Here's another 10 years and it just keeps repeating. And they're probably at that stage again where they keep going back to it every so often and thinking, can we get into it yet? Can we do we know what, how, it, how, how, how it works? No. Okay, we'll come back in 10 years' time. You know, they yeah. probably just keep doing that. And that's how I feel. And I'm sure other people feel that way as well. I'm, I don't think I'm the only one. I'm no, like, sure. Yeah, let me, <laughs> that, that, I thought this was quite funny. I thought the Italian Mussolini telegram story was about a crash and the remains given to the Germans. <laughs> well, the Italian guy, me and Vinny were talking to, <coughs> he actually had a, a, a remarkable story because apparently there was this uh, Italian witness account uh, there were two nordic looking aliens uh they ran into and one was one meter and one was about six meters or something <laughs> um and um yeah well me and uh, michael madalini uh well said maybe uh, they just ran into two german guys <laughs> yeah well, i mean, I mean Vinny, Vinny, Vinny mentions about the you know the possibly the gestapo getting a hold of the of the milan ufo uh, that was the rs33 device um right. and it's it's possible that they've traded it the, the certainly stories and they are only stories that um some italian scientists were working on flying discs in about 1941 1942 and that that um research work got passed to the Germans later on in the war. So the, there's kind of, you know, sort of there are not, I wouldn't say it's truth, but there's definitely stories to that effect that things were passed on to the Germans. But yeah. I, those particular stories, I don't I don't really put any credence behind them, I'm afraid. But as no. to whether or not the um, this, this you know, this 1933 craft ever got passed across, yeah, who knows? Right. So, yeah. So, Graham, uh, have you ever watched the Skinny Bob footage? I have, yeah. It's really weird. It's really, it's really, <laughs> it's, it's, a bit, it's, it's, it's a bit kind of like unsettling. Yeah. 
Yeah. So um, the the AI guy I was talking to, uh, he actually came up. Uh, he, he brought it up to me, mm. and uh, of course, you know, you know, he he is very. Uh, he's an expert in uh, you know whatever is a special effect or three D, etc. And uh, he still had a hard time um, debunking it. He really, yeah. really tried. Um, and supposedly there's the KGB logo in um, yeah you, know, you yeah, see it first is. yeah, yeah. Uh, so I don't I don't know how much how much truth there is behind it that, that's the first thing I'm going to say but when you watch it it was one of those things real. that like it, it it just had the hairs on the back of my neck standing up it was a bit kind of ooh. <laughs> it was just and it wasn't frightening it was just a bit it was really unsettling. Um, because it just looks well. And there's only one word for it. It looks alien. Yeah. Whether it is alien is a different matter. It might be just a kid in a, in a suit, but it, it's got that. It, it has that look of. I wouldn't say authenticity. It it's just the looks, movement. Yeah, yeah. It, it, there's a lot of things going on there which I don't f fully understand. I don't. I don't claim to be any kind of expert on image analysis or anything like that. That's, I'll leave that to others. It just looks unsettling. But whether it's true or not, I do really don't know. And I would tend to sort of believe that it might not be it's a, it's probably just an elaborate hoax and it might just been done really well but yes yeah, it's, yeah as uh, as dan says there it's andy in the suit actually yeah. I, I bumped into andy, so i could probably yeah it, he does actually look like andy in the suit uh, <laughs> <laughs> <if he's... laughs> yeah, that's mean man <laughs> yeah i don't mean that andy, really um so it looks yeah it, it does look alien but it, I say it could just be a kid in a suit. So who knows? But it's one of the. It's if it's one of the, if it's a forgery, it's one of the better ones because, it, as you say, it just looks really kind of weird. Yeah, you know, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And it's also Russian, and you know, uh, maybe they were messing around with nuclear things again. <laughs> they were messing around with a whole load of things, weren't they? They were, they were messing with <laughs> telekinesis, and uh, they had their own remote viewing, and they had some uh, weird, wonderful programs. I think anything that they could throw money at to try and get an advantage over the West, then they weren't they weren't sort of scared in doing it. Um, have you ever have you ever seen that film, um, Men Staring at Goats? Yes, I've read the book as well. <laughs> it's just really odd. <laughs> I don't pretend to know all the details about the remote viewing and all the rest of it, but it's it's. I have to get into that one day. There's just you know, it's one of the, it's Max. It's one of those kind of like parts of the whole UFO kind of subject that yeah, you, know, you just can't get your head around everything. So something has to be left alone. You know, I don't have enough time. I don't have enough hours in the day to go through it all. Um, so. I, I, but there's something I really want to have a look at one day and just think, mm, that's, that's so interesting. I must devote a few days just to really immersing myself in it, but I haven't yet. So I'll get right yeah. out of it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um, so uh, we did a, uh, so many, a vin many, many, my girl. Many. Many. <laughs> many. <laughs> Careful, we'll start, we might start following that. <laughs> Vinny, my mini. Um, so Vinny and me, we had a UK episode, uh, a while ago and, uh, we were talking about the Calvin, uh, case. Uh, oh yes. Your thoughts on that, sir? Yeah. It's possibly a secret American craft, possibly the Astra, but mm. it might not be, uh, you know, it's one of those stories that when I first heard about it, it was one of those ones where everybody sort of thought, yeah, this is going to be like, you know, the big kind of UK case. And to be fair, the time that when it first, when the first details came out, it was quite compelling. It was quite intriguing. And it still is, but possibly for the wrong reasons. It's more now due to, um, you know, this kind of thing about why have the MOD um, locked certain details away until, well, it's 2076 now. Uh, so it's a long time in the future. Uh, but also, you know, why aren't the witnesses coming forward? Um, you know, why why couldn't the Ministry of Defence find out which ha particular Harrier aircraft were in the picture? Uh, you know, why didn't the newspaper run the story when they had it originally? Why did they pass all the information onto the Ministry of Defence? There's a whole load of things which don't really make sense in this whole story. Um, so, yeah, I say it's an intriguing case, but not necessary for the right reasons. Uh, it, it just seems to get weirder and weirder the more you look into it. And I did actually write something on on Calvin for Sh the last Shadows of Your Mind magazine. I don't know whether you've right. actually had a chance to have a look at that. 
but it's a yeah it's a fascinating tale um but th there's a lot of kind of sort of things that lead towards it probably being some kind of secret u.s craft that they didn't right. really to see why test it over scotland if that was going to be the case you know it, it a lot of it doesn't add up yeah um so have you ever uh, looked into the, the dutch uh, susterberg case we have been covering yeah you know just what you've said about it so you've you've talked about it you talked about it on the the big phone home uh you've also talked about it with um with jazz i believe when i think you might have been on a program with him and you i think you might have been talking he was talking about it as well so only what i've heard you talk about it uh, yeah we we, we actually we actually talked to um <clears throat> one of the witnesses on the max yeah. Vinny show yeah did you see it no i haven't no i haven't seen that yet but I will now. <laughs> I'll rectify <laughs> that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You've caught me out. <laughs> no, no, no. It's actually quite interesting because especially uh, if you're an aviation uh, uh, freak and <clears throat> if you're interested in the military, especially. Yeah. <clears throat> this, is the, this is the military air base, isn't it? Where there was a lot of soldiers and a couple of officers looking yeah, at some strange craft that was hovering <laughs> over the base. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yes. Uh, 12 uh, Dutch military. It was also a shared base with the Americans and the Americans mm -hmm. on their side of the base. The they had uh, nuclear weapons. Yeah, yeah. But um, which, which year? Which year was this? Seventy nine. Seventy nine. Okay, so slap bang in the middle of the Cold War then. Yeah, definitely, mm. definitely. Uh, it's it, it's fascinating. Um, maybe maybe top five accounts, witness accounts uh, uh, in the world. I think. My, the funny my, thing is that. Uh, and the funny thing is that it's got it's had very little prominence, you know, in terms of a wider audience, hasn't it? I mean, you know, I've heard you talk about it, I've heard Jazz talk about it, I've heard a few other, I've heard Vinny talk about it, but beyond that, it it's never the story itself never seemed to be able to get traction anywhere else. It's not even on the scale of Calvin in terms of being talked about, you know, quite frequently, and and that's a real shame. Uh, and obviously, I you know, I, I hold my hands up and say that I haven't seen that, you know, the. The, the conversation that you had with Vinny about it, but I will, I will, I will, you know, do that. Um, but I feel that it probably should be, you know, sort of put out there a lot more because it, it's it's compelling, isn't it? From what you, what you talk about it. <clears throat> yeah, well, I think it's because uh, you know it's it, it's a Dutch case. You know, um, mm. it, <clears throat> if it's um, in the UFO community, it's American, British. It shouldn't uh, matter. Well, it shouldn't matter, but you know, I'm the it only. It shouldn't matter at all. But I'm the only idiot uh, covering it internationally. <laughs> but so. it doesn't matter whether it's it doesn't matter whether it happens in, in you know, it's a Dutch case or whether it's a Norwegian case or an Italian case. If it's important, if it's like you know going to push the the, you know, the uh, progress forward and trying to work out what's going on, then it should be looked at. It should be looked at by people not just in, in Holland but by you know everybody else. You know, it, it, it's one of these things that it shouldn't just be Britain. It shouldn't just be America. We shouldn't be, we're not the only people who write books. There's a whole lot of French books, uh, French UFO authors in the 50s, 60s and 70s who wrote some fantastic books, but they're only ever published in, in French. They never got right. an English translation. I've mm -hmm. got Italian books here that never got translated into, into English either. You know, right. so there's a whole <clears throat> lot of things that never, just because they weren't written in English, never got a, wide, a wider audience and that's a real shame you know and there's and there must be people you know looking at the subject in holland and germany and france and other countries that just don't get much of a look in because it's not in english and, and that's ridiculous i'm sorry you know it just it, it shouldn't be the case i know english is a is a universal like a worldwide language and it's used in aviation it's used in yeah. business and a lot of other things but that shouldn't be a, a kind of barrier to getting information out for sure for sure um <clears throat> so, uh, there was an interesting thing going on the, the other day with uh, St Stephen Greenstreet, it was. He um, <clears throat> made the connection, I, I saw it on Twitter actually, on his Twitter, <clears throat> where he uh, showed these images of these Chinese hel hel little helicopter looking like yeah, little, little drone drone things. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, they were, uh, I think it was AI um uh, uh driven and um they resembled the the i think the latest 2019 what was it the uss omaha yeah um, omaha, footage okay. a lot yeah a lot a lot now um when i talk to uh, uh other people about it they say well, i'm not convinced but that looked 
quite convincing to me that the, these Chinese are just, you know, buzzing these ships with their uh, uh, new technology. Yeah, drone technology is improving you know, each yeah. day. It's, it's getting better. Whether or not it's at the level that it could do the things that have been reported by the U.S. Navy in these various encounters, and not just the the Omaha one. There's, uh, I'm sure there have been other encounters. Um, there's talk about the is it the Boxer. There's another ship uh, back mm. in the late 1980s. I think it might be even 1989. Um, you know, there's there's another case which might get to hear about you know, at some stage. So. I'm not entirely sure whether drug technology is actually at the stage where it could account for a lot of things that have been reported, mm. but they're getting there. Yeah. And there'll, be, there'll come a stage where you know, the, te the, the drone technology will be able to hover for long periods of time. It'll be able to have a long endurance, so it'll, be, it'll have a, a long range. It'll do a lot of things that you know, we associate with maybe UAP, but whether or not that's actually at the stage now is a different matter. It's, an, it's, a, you know, it's a whole different debate. Um, personally, I'm not entirely sure that that's what was seen uh, by Omaha. You would have to have a platform nearby to launch them, you know, whether that's a submarine or a ship. Well, um, you know, if you that's know, the case, why wasn't that detected? You know, so there's a whole lot. Well, well maybe on. maybe these things can go long distance. You know, maybe they can. Maybe yeah. again, maybe this is just something that you know people aren't really aware of that they've discovered. You know, they've managed to invent something that that trans you know transcends what is normally uh, um, you know sort of what's been thought about as what they're capable of at the moment. Who who knows? Um, so yeah, I, it's a possibility, Max. Um, but that's uh, that's all it is. I did actually write an article about drones for the debrief some you know, a few months back, going oh, cool. and charting basically the technology of you know of you know where they started and, and you know what where they got to, um, but you know yeah ultra long range, ultra long endurance, not entirely sure we're there yet. Um, they could be getting close, but I don't think they've got all those pieces in place yet. And certainly maybe not to like, you know, be able to hover around US kind of training areas. I think they might have been able to down one by now, maybe secretly and find, mm -hmm. you know, find out whose it is. But maybe yeah. they have done and maybe they're just not saying who it is because they don't want to cause an international incident. Who knows? There's a whole lot of stuff wrapped up in this we're not privy to. It's another thing where we're not getting all the information, you know, uh, I love the stuff that's been coming out by George Knapp and Jeremy Corbell. You know, yeah. that was a, that was wonderful. All this all this stuff that was coming out. It was it was a it was a roller coaster ride. All, all this drip feed of information, you know, week after week. Uh, but it was tantalizing in so much as there wasn't there was some information about where it came from and what it represented, but we didn't have all the puzzle. So there was just enough doubt to make some people um you know your skeptics your debunkers etc think oh it's just camera defects or it's it's drones so i don't know um you know i, I wouldn't like to put money either way uh, i would and i can't even hope for one side or the other either but i don't i just don't know i really don't yeah know. so the dan the signal <laughs> has a question graham if you could fly in any of the ufos you've heard about which would you choose and why and this is the last time I'm going to let you ask you that question for free. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one, one I'd like to fly in. I think I'd like to know what the Socorro UFO was, the one that uh, Lonnie Zamora um, encountered in, oh, in, okay. in Mexico in 1964. That's Just a off good the top one. of my head, that's been, a, that's been a case I've been intrigued on. Just because of the markings on the side of the craft. Right. And that was the thing that really got me when I originally read about it. And I saw the I saw the drawing of the of the strange marking on the side of it. And I saw that back in the you know the 1970s. So and that were in this kind of egg-shaped craft that was in the desert, and these two two beings that got into it and then it flew off. Um, you know, that, that's that's the one that I think I might like to be in to work out where it was going, where it had come from, and whether it was some secret, you know, American craft or whether it was from somewhere else. Yeah. That that yeah. one. Yeah, the Lani Zamora. Thank account. you, Dan. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, Dan. Um, so uh, let me see. Is there anything else I want to cover with you? Um, yeah, the 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 little civil war going on uh, within the DOD. It seems like. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it seems like it's uh, coming to uh, 
a stalemate, I think. Um, uh, what, what, how did you perceive that? Uh, what, what, what are your thoughts about that? Because it's, it's really intriguing to me that within the highest ranks of the military and the politics, these people are just fighting in the streets, <laughs> basically, and uh, trying to discredit each other, uh, trying to, you know, uh, make the, the general public believe, for example, Mr. Elizondo was just the lawnmower and then Harry Reid has to step out and show a waiver or a, a piece of document uh, that he was actually the person he is. And, uh, you know, uh, heavyweights like Mellon, you know, uh, mm. actually have to having to vouch for him. If he yeah. were like a, regu a regular Joe, like Bob Lazar, he would be Lazar. Uh, yeah. So this is this is a, a quite, quite um, intriguing. I think somebody like think? Lazar, yeah, somebody like Lazar, because he's got a bit of a dodgy past, it's quite, inter it's quite easy to discredit him. You know, yeah, just well, he had, all he, had, surface, he, had a, isn't it? he had a brothel. <laughs> Well, exactly. So, you know, and, and and there's other things going on as well. So it's not that weird. Is, I have I have two. Oh, just oh well, there you go then. <laughs> yeah, I've got I've got three mates. Yeah, so don't you know, you, you, that, that's nothing. The uh, <laughs> the um, in terms of Lazar, he had so, so kind of a history that people it was easy to discredit, and anybody who wanted to could quite easily do it. Luis Elizondo is different because he was inside the military. Um, and but there's been a concerted campaign to try and discredit him or just to try and diminish his whatever you know kind of um influence he had and what position he had within the atip and uh, and elsewhere presumably so and that's come from you know somewhere within the pentagon that they've tried to just downplay his role and downplay his importance and of course all the the media attention he's been getting and and how he's galvanized you know uh, ufo twitter and beyond so you can understand on one level why why they might want to do that, but because it's played out in the in the public sphere, because people have managed to get you know the information through FOIA, like John Greenwald from the Black Vault, right. uh, he, he's you know got a hold of a lot of information, and other people have as well. Then you have to sort of think, well, really, were they, were, were they that naive that you know they didn't think all this was going to come out? You know, in the public realm, was it? You know, these emails that they've said, you know, oh, this none, none of this happened. Was it? Was it never going to come out? And then Louis, uh, you know, Lou was then going to turn around to how, uh, or you know, say, well, actually, this is all wrong, and I'm now going to try and do something about it. And the only recourse I've got, presumably, is to go through the Inspector General, and that's you know where all that came from. But also, then you've got people, you know, quite important people like Harry Reid, as you say, stood up for him. And you know, and, and wrote, even wrote letters saying you know, he was he did this, he did that. You know, he, yeah. he was who he said he was, and it, it just was makes Reed, the Pentagon. It, it was Reed's program. He hired yeah, exactly. The guy. If yeah. if anybody was to know who, who who was doing what and when, it was Harry Reed. It, yeah. it, it's crazy to suggest he didn't. So yeah. the Pentagon, it it just seems really weird that they've, they've chosen to go down this road. They've, they've chosen this hill to die on, if you like, that they're going to you know, have this battle. Now, you know, are they going to just roll over and accept it? Because that seems like they're all like undoing all the work that they've gone through to get to this point where they're still saying there's nothing to all this story. Um, but obviously, Lou Elizondo has got a reputation to uphold. He's got a yeah. livelihood to keep, to, 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 to keep going. I don't mean like he's making money from UFOs. I just mean he, he has to be seen as credible to, to employers, you know? So, if, you know, even just from that respect. Um, and if I was him, I'd be wanting to say, yeah, well, come on, hold on. You, you, you're trying to rubbish me. You're trying to discredit me. You know, I, I want the truth to come out. That's only natural. So yeah. I, I applaud the kind of course of action he's taking. Uh, and also at the same token, it might also open the door a bit more into working out what's actually going on behind the scenes here. You know, why are they trying to go down this path in terms of discrediting? You know, is there more going on? Well, obviously, we sort of know there is because you know yeah, there. that's where it all, that's what that's at the center of all this, isn't it? Definitely. And, uh, and I do feel, and I do feel, I feel for him as well. I, you know, I just want to put this on record. I really feel for him. You know, all yeah. the things he's gone through, you know, he's had a like a lever job. He, he had he felt he had to resign because things weren't going the way that it, he thought it should be. He couldn't have access to people that he thought should know information. Um, he, he's 
put himself out there in probably something that he's reluctant, to, he might have been reluctant to get involved with. He always says that he, he could pass it up to somebody tomorrow, he would, and he must be taking his toll, you know, it's taking its toll financially, um, you know, uh, mentally as well. So, yeah, I really do feel for him. Yeah, I feel for Lou too. Um, and uh, Vinny mentions the evil queen, Susan Gao. Gao. <laughs> yeah, Gao. Goff. <laughs> Goff. Goff. Yeah, it Goff. sounds like, yes. a, Goff. Sounds like a anal disease. Uh. <laughs> but uh i've golf in my butt but anyways <laughs> um but to but to uh let, let, let's talk about uh stephen green street for a second he's he's playing devil's advocate a little bit yes you know yeah. uh, and well rightfully so you know you have, always have to question everything so i do respect him for that uh but um what he says you know this could be also be a very um refined way of this information to take the attention of something that is much more embarrassing that they might be uh be that they might are being technologically um uh, being uh, how do you say this um uh over powered by other uh adversaries or something mm. um so let's say that the, the chinese drones are so advanced they have to make up some sort of dis disinformation and they they make up its uap so uh the general public thinks <laughs> actually there's uap in our skies and um you know we don't have the embarrassment that we are technologically behind right. on some yeah. of our d direct adversaries yeah and some of that could be going on you know i don't think anybody's like naive enough to rule all that out at this stage um and yes um you know mr green street is i suppose he's acting like a journalist isn't he that's what he is he's a journalist like you he, he, you know you, you ask questions you're not going to come down on one side or another as like a true believer and i don't think i would ask probably expect him to nor i would expect you to either so asking questions is fine um yeah and so he has triggered some people because I think some, I think some people did actually think he was a believer, because of what he said in the past, and then they were quite surprised when he sort of, what's the phrase, reverted to type, if you like. He, he became a journalist, you know, on Twitter and started asking all kinds of questions mm -hmm. and started putting things out like the drones. Now, personally, I've got no real problem with him. Um, I have spoken to him once or twice, um, and, and I've had messages on Twitter, a couple of messages on Twitter from him. Um, I don't Steve. really know him. I don't know him that well, but. Yeah, I I don't have a problem with what he's asking and what he's putting forward, because no, I think frankly, it's fair. It, it's fine to ask questions. It's fine to put the other side of the debate. You know, it's when people do it um, maliciously, or when they've got a, an axe to grind, or they've got a a, a book to pedal. That's not what he's doing. No, that's what. I'm, well, this is what I'm yeah. trying to get at. Or they've got a position to defend. That's when it starts getting sort of like into the realms of well, no, you shouldn't be doing that. But I don't yeah. think I don't think that's what he's doing. I think he's just asking questions, and um, and it could be that he's just literally he's asking you know, asking these questions to try and get information out of people, to try and sound people out to see where they're coming from, to get yeah. maybe just people talking. It could be as simple as that. And you know. I ask I ask questions like that myself when I, I when I was writing the drone article for the debrief. I was trying to work out whether some of these things could be drones. Uh, I didn't come to that conclusion, but yeah, you know, it was always in the back of my mind that you know, it can, like you it say, can be both. The, Russian, yeah. the Russians or the Chinese could have developed things that we may not be aware of. They're not going to tell us. Um, so yeah, it could have been that position, or it could just be that that is the 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 explanation for certain things. You know. Um, when I'm looking at the Foo Fighter stuff, I've got the nose in the back of my head that some of it could be German secret technology. And I do have to keep checking. And I do have to keep telling myself, you know, don't just assume it's this. You know, um, I'm not a journalist, but I'm a, I'm a writer, I'm an author. So I do have to do a bit of due, due diligence in terms of what I'm doing and what I'm writing to make sure, sure I'm not just yelling old rubbish down. Um, so, you know, I would expect others to do the same and not just go down this kind of echo chamber of everybody saying the same things everybody come from the same position it's great to, it's fine to have a different you know a different viewpoint on things to ask questions about what's going on it's not fine to do it just maliciously or for you know just for because you've got like a dogma 
Um, you know, you, you believe in that, um, like certain other people who I think you know we all know and love. But um, you know, but that, 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 that's, that's their that, well, and you know maybe they could say the same about us. So you know who knows? Mm. It, I do still think it's healthy to have skeptics. Remember, uh, Graham, we were we were on the big phone home together. Yeah, we were. And and I asked Lou to answer the you, question. You asked him some very very pertinent and awkward questions, and he. It wasn't <laughs> awkward at all. It was. They were real. They were real questions, but no, they were just questions, weren't they? It's a question. That's all it was. So yeah. you know, it's fine to do that, and and that's what that's why you were there for. I think because I you want. I think what made it awkward was that I asked, look, it, it, if you're in this community, it's very easy to not be critical and, you know, just take anything for as it is. But, you know, uh, at, at that time, um, there was no data along with the footage. Later, there was some data along with the footage. Yeah. But I was asking for data, you know, you, you know, we really yeah, need data. And, you know. And I remember his phone was overheating and, uh, you know, he was dancing around a little. And then I asked him, please, can, can you answer the question? And actually, Lou really respected that because, yeah. um, you know, because I, I'm serious about this. And <clears throat> so, Stephen, and look what happened. Data came along, <laughs> you know, yeah. just a couple of months later. Yeah. So I've got I've I, got no pro I've got no problem with people asking questions. I think I have a problem when people ask questions because they've got an agenda behind it. But I don't see that in his case, and I, and I certainly didn't see that in yours during the big phone home. So say so I've got no real problem with that. I think some people take it personally. I think maybe all it is. I think people sort of we have we, we're built we're interested in this hobby um, in the hobby. Sorry, we're interested in your in this subject, and sometimes when people come and ask awkward questions. You, you, sometimes people think it's like a personal attack on what they believe in. Uh, it's not quite a religion, but it, it, it sometimes it gets to that point with, with some people. And yeah. maybe that's just, you know, it just touches a nerve. Um, but people believing things strongly, that's great as well. I, I haven't got a problem with that either. But it might be just a case that it does you know, push a button when somebody asks a question which is a little bit too close to what they're interested in, what they're particularly kind of their belief is that you know right. this is true or that's true and then somebody comes along and questions it and maybe has a little bit of kind of the question is phrased in a way that there's a bit of information there which just might be correct might be true you know like yes okay the chinese just might be responsible for one or two of these incidents right you know and that maybe just touches that nerve and therefore that's where you get the reactions from um i don't think he's being too malicious with it and, and from what i've seen and what i've heard of what he's saying and what i've read he's just he's asking questions that maybe somebody else might have asked you know maybe you might have asked or maybe somebody else, somebody no, I, else I, might have asked. I gotta admit uh, i i i really softened throughout the months you know i i i, I gotta admit uh i really i really want you know, I, I I just want to investigate, of course, mm -hmm. but um, I, I I have to admit I, I did lose a little bit of my journalistic criticism. You know, um, I, I I I maybe I went into the rabbit hole a little bit. Uh, so when when Stephen came out and uh, you know uh, is asking really compelling questions, critical mm -hmm. questions, I thought, yeah, dude, you go. You know, uh, because I know for a fact Stephen wants this to be true. But he, uh, you know, if you are in pursuit of the truth, you yeah. sometimes have to step on some toes, and uh, you know, poke around a little bit. That's 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 what that's our job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I really respect him for that, actually. Yeah, I mean, really, people ask me, you know, what do I believe in in this subject? Do, do I believe they exist and all the rest of it? And my answer usually ends up in something like this, where you know, I'll, I'll follow. I mean, I'm looking for the truth. But whatever that truth is, when I, if I, if and when I ever find it, I'll accept it. Whatever it is, you know, sure. wherever that truth is, um, I don't want it to be something or other. You know, I don't have that kind of. It has to be this or it has to be that, because I think if you go down those lines, I think right. you end up being t putting yourself in a position where your belief so strong in something that you have to defend it at all costs against other possible avenues or you know, inconvenient facts that come up or, or new bits of information because they do come along. People find out things all the time. And 
sooner or later, that worldview that you you set yourself up with, if you you know get yourself down that rabbit hole to believe in one particular thing, is going to be challenged. And it's going to be challenged probably quite successfully by somebody that you then end up in a position where you can't defend it and you just end up looking stupid. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that rather than like say I believe that aliens and I believe they come from Zeta Reticuli and you know, they're you know they're six foot tall and they're green and or they're grey and all the rest of it. Yeah. I don't want to go there because oh. I don't know enough. Yeah, I'm not an expert. I haven't had you know, I haven't had my, my own kind of experiences in terms of you know, being an experiencer. So I don't have that. I'm a nuts and bolts person. So that's all I've got to fall back on. I'll look at records. I'll look at information. I'll look at data. I'll look at eyewitness accounts. Um, but I'm happy just to go where it takes me. And if it takes me somewhere else, and that's maybe not as, you know, as good to some people as what it ends up as well that's that's the way it is you know i'll just accept where it takes me I, i'm not sure. i don't have any kind of you know kind of vested interest in it has to be this or it has to be that uh, i'm not that you know i'm not that kind of precious sort of thing uh, and i think if you do set yourself up that way that you definitely oh it's got to be this you know um i, I think about these people who say there's a, spe a secret space force and you know you might have come across these people before, uh, and in some uh, some you know people other people well, I know think it's a bit of a joke, you know. And I would never go there because you're going to set you really are setting yourself up for a fall if you start saying those kind of things. For because sure, it, it's it's almost laughable, really, because the people who say these kind of things have never really had any evidence. It's all just hearsay. Yeah. Um, and sooner or later, they're, they're probably going to get found out. So it's a bit of a laugh, but you know, I'd never put myself in that position. Even yeah. with the Foo Fighters, you know, I'm yeah. I'm constantly wanting to just check and recheck what I'm doing, and see I'm not trying to put myself down an avenue where I'm saying to people this is what they are, and this is I'm going to change the the information in my book to make sure people believe that. You know, I'm, I am saying what I don't think they what I think they're not. <laughs> But that's not the same thing. And I'd also hope that when people do read the book, they're going to come at me with a whole load of questions and say, is this right? How do you get this? You know, have you thought this through properly? How, how have you got to that particular position? Because I want, I, I want a proper discourse, you know, and I want to be able to answer questions. I want to be able to have be asked awkward things. You know, like yeah. you, you know, I, I don't mind if you come back to me afterwards and and say a whole lot of stuff, you know, which I might not be comfortable with. That's part and parcel. Oh, I can do that. Don't worry. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that. <laughs> but that's but that's, but that's that's where I, that's where I am. I'm not set down some road that it's going to, you know, sort of be. They have to be this. They have to be that. I'm not like that. No, and so. and my problem with with debunkers... that's what a reptilian would say. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. was so funny. I'm, just gonna, I'm gonna hold on. I'm just gonna take the zip off down the back, and I'm gonna like reveal myself. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. But you know, my problem with debunkers, like uh, for example, Mick West is, is they don't really debunk. They just simply offer another explanation, yeah. <laughs> and they bend well, backwards to offer that yeah. explanation. It doesn't mean that it's that whatever we see is is not true it's just that like you know um it could also be this you know yeah. basically do I that think some of, i think some of the debunkers before mcwest um i'm not going to mention names but people will know who they are what they used to do was cherry pick bits of a case and then come up with a explanation that could possibly possibly very tenuously explain that or they would try and explain one bit, and that, that just ruled out everything else. But they didn't look at the case as a whole, um, and that and yeah. that really set people back because one, you know, that doesn't get any anybody anywhere. I'm sure they felt themselves really. I thought they were, they were really good in just saying, "Oh, well, that could be a seagull, or that could be Venus." <laughs> yeah. But then they didn't really look at why people were saying what they were. And that set back you felt you quite a bit because people would listen to them and think, oh, well, well they've solved the case. But actually, no, they hadn't. They just offered a possible alternative to one That's bit it. of it. But they hadn't taken it all in the whole. And I think unless you do that, then you you, you can't really say you've solved something. You, you do have to look at everything. Um, but then again, people who believe have to do the same. It's not just the skeptic side. It's the people who believe in what's going on or the people who you know look into it and think, yeah, there might be something here they have got to do exactly the same. They've got to come up with the evidence. They've got to come up with the explanation that holds water. You know, they, they have to be able to 
you know, sort of not defend it, but they have to explain it um, because otherwise, they're just, you know, people are just as bad as each other. Um, the the skeptics who I really sort of do look to, um, mm. there's one who it's called it's called Micah Hanks. I'm sure you've heard of him. He has uh, he has a podcast in the states, and he called he he class or at least he used to class himself as an informed skeptic. Um, you know, he would he wouldn't necessarily come down one side or the other, but he would give you know, the side, like a lot of room to talk about it. And he would ask proper questions, you know, just like you do, um, you know, to get to the bottom of it. And he, he used to lean towards it, things being, yeah, that could be true, but mm -hmm. he wouldn't just like come down as a true believer. And, you know, and I still listen to his podcast even now. Um, even uh, he, It used to be called the Grelian Report years ago, but it's now the Micah, Hunt podcast, uh, Micah Hanks podcast. So, you know, I would encourage anybody who's out there who hasn't heard it to listen to it because it's really good. And he covers a whole lot of things, uh, but he doesn't come down wholeheartedly on one side or the other. He just explains it quite a lot and in quite good detail, and and it makes people think. And that's how it should be. Yeah, definitely. Well, on that note, Mister Graham Randall, yeah. um, you you're not going to give away when your book is uh, probably gonna. Do you know why? I, I don't know. It's because it's in the lap of the gods. I'm, I'm so, I literally, I'm waiting for somebody just to finish writing the forward and give it to me. And then when that occurs, hopefully come on, Christopher Mellon, come uh. on, <laughs> come on. You notice I'm not giving anything away here. Um, <laughs> so when that when that happens, then it'll be out. So um, um, it's not in my hands. Let's put it that way. I get it. I get it. But if it's all up to the forward, that guy has to step his shit up. I'm sorry. We, I, can't, I'm we sure, cannot I'm wait sure for that is. book. We cannot wait I'm for sure that book. Is. Do you know where it's going to be available? Amazon. On Amazon? All right. On and Amazon. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to promote the shit and out of that. Thank you very much. Uh, at the moment, it'll be uh, it'll be a softback book, so it'll be a hard copy. Uh, there will be eventually a Kindle version of it, but I'm not sure entirely when that'll be because that'll be in the end of a bit of work. By the so. way, I, I I wouldn't mind if you would email me the book already, but that, that's the, uh, but it, I just say, I, but yeah, you did. Just is, say this thing, is this thing is this thing on? No, no, no uh, I think I just heard. Yeah, there's whispers. There's a seagull speaking. <laughs> all right yeah, I'll, hey, see what, I'll see what i can do uh that that would be awesome hey graham thank you for an amazing chat my friend uh, no, i really you, enjoyed man. it and uh well let's do this anytime well you know what i'm a ferry ride away from amsterdam because the, the the north shields to amsterdam ferry you know sort of runs every day and i'm sure i'll be in amsterdam sometime in the future so i'll look you up next time i'm, I'm in town man I'll, I'll 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 show you around town <laughs> lovely thank you all right okay to all my okay. viewers or our colleagues um whenever graham's book uh drops uh I i'm gonna promote it but buy it uh it's gonna be awesome and uh, i know you guys will love it so without it's bedtime it's late um i had a great time thank you graham and thank you we are going out max out graham out boom